I'm Sithrith. I'm Draculetta. I'm Mathelros. And you're listening to Radio Free Tyria, the Guild Wars 2 podcast for the casual crowd. This week we don't actually have Draculetta with us. He is sick. So this week it's just Thelros and I. Sorry for all you people who, who just love Draculetta. We love Draculetta too, but unfortunately he is sick. And so it's probably for the best that he goes and, you know, recovers his voice. I don't I don't actually know what he's sick with. I assume it's a cold because it's that time of year. Uh, but hopefully he gets better and we get him back next week. But uh, this week, specifically this weekend, right now while we're recording is Beta Weekend number three. It is also the final Beta Weekend of uh, Guild Wars 2 Heart of Thorns, so that's pretty cool. I haven't had an opportunity to play it as much as I would have liked, which is kind of disappointing, um, but it is only, uh, what, Saturday? So still have, you know, all of today for me, because it's actually Sunday morning here, and then also tomorrow. So there's still a lot of time. Uh, but I, I've i tried out the Druid a bit. Uh, I... Tried it out in PvP. Uh, like I usually do, I only do PvP. Um, and we actually did some PvP yesterday in Stronghold. Uh, I played Revenant a little bit and Reaper. And Reaper was, Reaper is in a really great place. Like I'm really excited now actually for, uh, Heart of Thorns to come out. I'm really excited that, uh, I have two Necros and one is gonna be a Reaper. So, yes, uh, Reaper is way, way better than it was. What was it? Two betas ago, when they first released the oh, Reaper, two or three. Yeah. yeah, and it was it was not it's in a great three. place. Like the skills weren't great, and it was just the damage wasn't very good. But now, uh, I think it's pretty much on par, if not better, uh, especially depending on how you trade it, than current necromancers. So you know, yeah, it'll definitely take some getting used to. I still have to get used to using the great sword skills compared to like you know daggers, like, running up and stabbing people with daggers like I do right now, but otherwise it's it's awesome, and uh, Reaper Shroud is especially really great. So that's really cool. Um, I did do a little bit with Druid as well, and uh, at first I tried just using the staff, because, you know, staff, that's like a cool novelty thing. It didn't work out as great as I'd hoped, but then I remembered, you know, weapons, weapon switching is a thing, so I decided to, like, fight mostly with the long, or, yeah, the longbow, and then occasionally I would switch to staff in team fights, and that was amazing. Um, I mean, I know last episode, uh, Drac and I kind of expressed concerns that maybe Druid would be a bit OP or something, but I definitely don't think that's the case. It's definitely a very powerful healer, but, I mean, if, you know, if you're getting focused fired, you're still gonna die. Everybody's still gonna take a whole lot of damage and eventually will die. You're not gonna be invincible. But it definitely helps out in team fights. Um, I didn't get to play it a whole lot, but yeah, like using longbow, like I can still maintain a lot of damage, which is great. But I also get this other layer of utility through healing my teammates. So I'm definitely a fan of druid. Definitely going to be making my ranger a druid. And I also did play around a little bit with like the engineer scrapper, with the two-handed hammer. That's pretty cool. I don't have much to compare it to because, like I said before in other episodes, I don't really play my engineer as much as I would like, but the hammer definitely makes it way better. I definitely recommend trying that out because it's super cool. But like, uh, I think it's the skill number three where it's like just you leap, 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 and <laughs> it's it's really fun. So yeah, I'm now that we have all the elite specializations out, I am really excited for Heart of Thorns. Um, I'm, yeah, all the, all the elite specializations are in really good places right now, I think, and I don't really have a whole lot else to say about the elite specializations, just because it's like, yeah, they're, they're good. I'm excited to use some of them. Do you think you're gonna be using any of the elite specs on your characters, Athoros? Um, I'm thinking about maybe using Chronomancer, although I'm not sure exactly how it's gonna, how it's gonna work out, especially since it's 
seems to be kind of on the more powerful than it should be side. Right. right now, as far as I know, they didn't really get any nerfs of note recently. Um. Compared to, say, Ellie's. But. Right. Tempest yeah. Tempest in particular. Tempest is still um, very strong. But the, the counter. Tempest do a ton of DPS very quickly, but the counter is that they are also very squishy. Like, you could just kind yeah, of. Yeah, you need to be good at playing. Right, you could just kind of it's breathe kind of like, on a Tempest yeah, and they just fall over. Yeah, like it's the same with normal alleys, really. You run into some of them and they just pop instantly, and others they who know how to use the water right. um, aspect, it kind of they become incredibly, incredibly difficult to kill. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, Dragon Hunter, I'm kind of eh. Yeah. Like, my guy is more of a direct support rather than sits in the back and supports. It doesn't seem to really suit his style. Mm-hmm. Uh, Necro is just not not something I'm interested in for this character, at least. Okay. I just don't particularly want to be a kind of melee big sword dude person. Yeah. Uh, didn't you, you recently switch kind of, to daggers, um, though, on your Necro? Well, kind of, but I don't really use them that often in PvP. Oh, okay. They're just sort of there. Fair enough. Um, the only other one I was kind of looking to was Druid, even though I don't have a ranger. Right. So well, I yeah. Do, I eventually roll one. I'll... Uh, try using that, especially with the you know, um, healing dedicated healer right. build mm-hmm. that it has. I'll be pretty interested in using that because I like using um, supportive builds in the other classes. So yeah, now that Those. I think about it, you you're running a support build on your necro, very heavy support build on your guardian, and weren't you recently looking into getting a support build for your mesmer? Um, I'm looking into doing it. I'm not sure how well it's going to work out. Right. Doesn't seem to be quite as directly support focused as the other ones, but mm-hmm. we'll see how it goes. Yep, makes sense. Mm. Yeah, so I'm I'm definitely looking forward to the elite specs. Um, another cool thing I noticed with this beta was that they introduced the new uh, elite specialization class icons. So, like you know, when you're in character select screen, when you look at your little profiles of each character, they've got the little uh, Profession icon, so like the necros will have that fanged skull, mesmers will have the butterfly mask thing, but um, with the elite specs, if your character has an elite spec, you know, traded or whatever, you get a new little profession icon. So the um, the dra- or the revenant herald gets like a little dragon head. The scrapper has this like spiked kind of gear thing. Chronomancers predictably have a clock, etc. So that's kind of cool. Um, it could, I could see it getting a little bit confusing. I think it'll take a little bit of getting used to, but um, I think once everybody kind of adjusts to that, it'll be good. Cause then I know bef- in the previous betas, it's like you get into a PvP match and like I have to like be like, okay, now who on my team is actually a guardian or are they a long, or, you know, are they a dragon hunter kind of thing? So now you know you'll be able to actually tell, which is cool. I like that. Um, but I think, you know, with, they do, I know they do intend to add more elite specializations down the line, so I could see it getting confusing if they, you know, keep making new profession icons for the new elite specs. But, uh, I guess it depends on how many elite specs we end up having per profession. So we'll see, I guess. Yeah, I think, like you kind of mentioned, it is going to be confusing. I find it kind of, to figure out what the heck kind of class they were. But I think these kind of specialists didn't change the class enough, especially with some of them, like uh, um, I guess Dragon Hunter kind of changes the class quite a bit in terms of how it plays. Right. But like some of them change it so I mean Druid goes with Oh yeah, Druid for sure. Changes it so drastically that you kind of need to know. Mm-hmm. Especially in PvP, I like, got a glance what they're gonna be doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, even with yeah. the ones that don't change as quite as much, like Mesmer versus Chronomancer, like, I feel like a Chronomancer is not really a change from how Mesmers are currently, but more of just an extension of their abilities. But, for example, in PvP, I'm going to want to approach a Chronomancer way differently than I would just a normal Mesmer. Cause I need to you don't approach it. Me- yeah, basically meaning I'm going to stay very far away from a Chronomancer in PvP, because I don't want to have to deal with that shield clock thing. Yeah, I think Maybe something they could have tried is having both icons there, showing their oh, main yeah. class and their subclass. I'm not sure whether it'd be too cluttered, but 
I guess it would ease the transition of knowing what the heck this icon is. That's true. Like what class it represents. Yeah. I feel like even if not for this iteration of Elite Specializations, but maybe in the next round of Elite Specializations they released, maybe adding that would make it easier to tell. Because yeah, yeah. I think honestly I think that would be the safer one to uh, bet to go with than just expecting people to just get used to it fast because right. there's a lot of icons there. Well that's the so thing. We have clear what they represent. Like, we now the have one is the Reaper, right? Yeah, the hooded one is the Reaper. Yeah, it, 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 I saw the, um, like the picture of all of them. Some of them I had no idea. Yeah, they were. me neither. Um, I know when I looked at them, I assumed the dragon head was the dragon hunter because That's what I dragon. But apparently that is the uh, herald's icon and the shieldy looking icon thing is the dragon hunter. I think. Which doesn't really make yeah. sense. I guess it's it's also got like an shields. arrow above it, so I guess that's supposed um, to be like... Yeah, that's the point is, it's like, it's hard to tell. Right. So that might be something worth trying out. Yeah. So that's that's definitely something. Um, but yeah, the, the new icons are interesting, if nothing else. So, um, yeah, so that's the Elite Specializations. Like usual, I didn't do any of the PvE beta stuff because I want to stay... Spoiler free, I want to keep all that stuff fresh and shiny and new for when it actually comes out. One thing that did happen, I know a lot of people were really, really excited about trying out raids because they were going to turn on raids for this beta and everybody was super excited. But unfortunately, they had to turn them off because they were having a lot of problems with the enhanced squad UI. So that's kind of unfortunate. Mm. Um, they did put out a whole big blog post about the enhanced squad UI. Um, again, mm. I don't have a commander tag, so I'm not really familiar with setting up squads generally, uh, but basically the gist is that this is a more compact and simplified way to be able to see a huge amount of people's uh, health bars, and you can also then broadcast specific messages to different squads. So that's pretty cool uh, for World v. World and for raids. Uh, another thing to note that they did say is that you don't have to be a commander to start a raid, because that wouldn't make sense. Um, you can make a invite-only raid group with squads of up to, you know, you can have up to 10 people. So if you don't have a commander tag, don't worry, you can still run a raid. So that's good. Um, but yeah, that's that's squad UIs. But uh, we did want to talk a little bit about Stronghold, since this is the last beta. Um, we did want to talk a little bit about Stronghold, because I think we've mentioned it before, we really freaking love Stronghold. It's amazing. Um... It's really different from the other uh, PvP mode, or the main PvP mode, Conquest. Because Conquest is kind of like, you know, it's captured the three points, and each map has slight variations on this. This is different. There's, you have, your character, your team has a lane that starts at your keep and ends at their keep. They have a lane that starts at their keep and ends at your keep. The goal is to destroy the Lord in the other keep. While protecting your lord, you do this by going into the middle, getting supplies, bringing them back to your base, and either sending out door breakers, which explode the gates leading up to the lord's keep, gate, castle, whatever. And you can also summon archers, which uh, help kill guards along the way and other, you know, player characters. And occasionally you can also summon mist heroes, which are like super mega NPCs that can help kill or break down the gates and kill the lord and other player characters, I guess. So a lot of people, because of the lane system and because of the stream of NPCs, a lot of people compare Stronghold to MOBAs like League of Legends or Dota 2. And um, we disagree. <laughs> um, basically, like I'm not saying that it would be bad if it was like League of Legends or Dota 2 or whatever, because I think I mentioned last week, like, Thoros has somehow managed to convince me to start playing League of Legends, and it's actually really fun, and I like it for some reason. But, um, basically, I disagree that Stronghold is like a MOBA, because the thing is, with League of Legends or Dota 2, the minions, like the NPCs that go towards the other keep, they just kind of go in a constant stream. Like, there's, there's no, you don't have to do any input. There's nothing you need to do about it. They just keep going. Whereas, if you don't do anything in Stronghold, NPCs aren't going to do anything either. They're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to exist, basically, except for the guards that are already at certain uh, gates along the way. 
So I think that's a big part of it. Um, and I also just don't really believe that having a lane system with keeps at either end is really the kind of key defining gameplay thing of MOBAs. It's, it's certainly yeah. important, but it's not the end-all be-all, I don't think. Yeah, I think what I think about this is is that, yes, having these lanes and having minions go down a certain preset path and kind of breaking down the various barriers to get to the, like, the enemy's base is like... I mean, it's, it's a thing, a mechanic that they share with MOBAs, but I don't think it's enough to kind of qualify them for this thing that people like strongholds them trying to cash in on the whole MOBA craze. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's enough to kind of validate that. Right. I think they it just, it's a mechanic that works and that's pretty fun, considering mm-hmm. how popular MOBAs are. They're just using a mechanic that's popular, not just their meter, but various tower defense games and other games that use that. Right, and the other thing is I think that makes those mobile games with the, uh, like League of Legends and Dota 2 except, like really different from Stronghold is with Stronghold I feel like you really do need to have both offense and defense in order to um, you know be successful whereas kind of arguably you just need offense in MOBAs. Well League it's more um, managing where the creep waves are because they're automatic and mm-hmm. always pushing right. you just need to be there to pick them up with Stronghold it's like Sometimes some games like we've done bomb either side where no one's sending out minions at all, so there's no, no no point to worrying about defending. Right. Because you cannot break the gates on your own. Mm-hmm. Yep, I agree. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think... It... Preferring Stronghold overall, I think... <laughs> I think we mentioned this before. I'm not sure if it was on this show or the previous one we did, but um, I think the single most thing I do prefer over the other PvP modes, um, Team Deathmatch or whatever, and uh, Conquest. Conquest is just the fact that you don't spend much time standing around. Yeah. Like in Conquest, there's a lot of time you spend either defending a point or capturing it, which takes about at least five seconds. Mm-hmm. Sometimes more than that, if they've already captured it. And it's, yeah, it gets a bit tedious. Right. Whereas with Stronghold, like the only time I remember... Standing still that much is when I'm either defending our main area, like the keep, mm-hmm. in which case there's usually stuff happening, otherwise you wouldn't be standing there, or you're capturing one of the hero points. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the mystic stuff. Which usually stuff. get interrupted, considering they're spread on the map anyway. Right, yeah. And there's yeah. not much else to capture, really, so they tend to be contested pretty hard. Yeah, it's pretty rare to just walk up to a Mist Essence capture thing and then just get it uncontested. Usually somebody comes up to try and take it from you. Yeah. But yeah, you're yeah, always lot- always running exactly. around in Stronghold. Yeah. Which is, and yeah. Obviously, having NPCs, I think some people might argue that it kind of cheapens it a bit, but I actually like having them. It provides a lot more... Um, like, it's not just a matter of who can kill the other team better. Right. Although it, tends, it also does tend to be a factor in Stronghold. Oh, not sure. Much. It does provide that, because sometimes you can get heroes, like you said, enough, like maybe one or two heroes at once, mm. and they can do quite a bit of damage if they're not controlled by the other team. Exactly. Like I've had a couple of times where it's like either me just buffing the hero enough that they can break down the gate, because mm-hmm. there was no one there defending it. With PvP, it's pretty much who can rotate around the different points the best. So that's really all the kind of strategy you can get out of it, because it's more limited. Mm-hmm. In, At least in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, sure, in, in certain Conquest maps, uh, there's definitely some strategy based on whatever their kind of unique thing is. So, like, for Skyhammer, sky hammer, there's this, there's the Skyhammer. Like, who controls the Skyhammer kind of gets a pretty good advantage. Or, I mean, Stronghold has the catapults. So, that's true. Uh, yeah, with, with Stronghold, you're always doing something. You're either trying to man the catapults, you're getting supply, or you could be uh, kind of camping the supply to prevent the other team from getting any supply, because if, if you know, if you stop the other team from getting supply, they can't break down your gates, so it's kind of stalled out the game for them. Or um, you could be a jackass and camp the enemy spawn point. That too. You could do that. Not recommended. It's kind of kind of not very nice. But uh, you that is certainly a strategy. <laughs> um but yeah, so I feel like there's so many different strategies because there's so many different components to Stronghold. There's the trebuchets, there's the supply, there's, you know, and then once you get the supply, do you want archers? Do you want doorbreakers? There's the 
uh, different mist champions you can choose from, um, because each of the mist champions you can summon do different things. There's so many layers of uh, complexity to Stronghold, and that's what I think makes it so much more engaging and interesting than the other Conquest maps. I still like the Conquest maps. They're definitely great, but I think Stronghold is so much more... I think I feel like it's just more well-designed and more interesting. Yeah. I feel like they have a decent base mm-hmm. for the mode that they have. I, there is, I think I just would like them to add more on, onto it. In two areas, mainly, I think. First, they only have one map, which is kind of visually boring. Right. Yeah, like pirates are cool and everything, but you only get one map, and it's still kind of... Uh, I mean, to be fair, when when the Stronghold map first came out, I thought it was pretty cool looking, but I feel like, you know, at this point, we've played it yeah. so much that it's kind of just like, yeah, now it's just a thing. Yeah, so add more maps, hopefully, soon after the launch, assuming there's no major issues with Stronghold. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is the NPCs. Yeah, the door breakers are important. I think they work out fine. Right. Because not only are they just generally squishy, the enemy guards, the NPCs, kill them in one hit. Right. I'm pretty sure. One or two, like yeah. It's real, one or two hits. It's real easy for them to be killed. They yeah, it's out. a good I like, balance. I like that mechanic. Mm-hmm. The archers are just kind of fodder, really. They don't do much unless you already have an advantage. Yeah, that's the thing. If you have an advantage, you can kind of get a whole bunch of supply all at once and just send out a ton of archers all at once, and it's very overwhelming, but that requires you to have a pretty strong advantage already, so it's kind of like, if you're behind, you're not going to be wasting time trying to get archers because you're going to be busy defending. Right, exactly. Yeah, I'd like to see archers maybe buffed a little bit. Yeah, maybe make them better at killing either guards or other players. Yeah, I feel like it takes, like, I think the idea is that archers are supposed to take out the guards before the doorbreakers get to them, but I feel like it takes the archers too long, maybe? Hmm. So, maybe a little bit. I'm pretty sure archers archers can't kill doors at all. No, they can't kill, they they shoot at the the doors, but it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, I think the uh, other thing I would like them to do is maybe add at least a third NBC class. Um, Mm -hmm. Maybe one that's kind of meant for sieging the main keep. So, say, they don't do much damage, but they are resistant to, say, NPC damage. Okay. So, like, they can tank the Lord. Right, and okay. the various mob of NPCs inside that. I think maybe adding more of those, because they'll have a use after the gates have already been broken. Because after you've like, broken those gates, that's great useless. Isn't that kind of more like what the, the Miss Heroes are for, though? Uh, kind of, but maybe, I don't know. I just feel like they could be more NPC diversity than yeah. there currently is. I could see that. Yeah. I think they could also do interesting things in the future with Stronghold where instead of, you know, needing to break down the gate, maybe there's some other thing that needs to be dealt with. And so instead of door breakers, a map has, like, I, I don't know. I can't think of something. But I'm, sh- you know, you know what I'm saying. Like, they could have some kind of map-specific mechanic that isn't gates. Like digging a tunnel underneath it. Right, yeah. Like, you have to dig a tunnel, so you have to get Script diggers or something, yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. That. Yeah, just more diversity in the NPCs, I think, would be nice. And make archers more relevant mm-hmm. than they currently are. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's about it. That's that's kind of all the beta thoughts I have, because this is the last one before Heart of Thorns, which is pretty cool. Um, we have a little over two weeks, which is exciting. Um, hold on, let me look at my handy dandy countdown timer. It is, um, it's loading. It's loading. It's, we have two days, or no, not two days. Oh my gosh. No. <laughs> we have two weeks and five days until Heart of Thorns launches. So that's pretty cool. And, um, this week, uh, ArenaNet has been focused on talking about guilds. But before I got, before I talk about guilds, I want to get something out of the way. You might remember, not last week, but I guess like the week before, before TwitchCon, um, we talked about how they were uh, kind of hyping everybody up on Twitter and stuff, and they tweeted like this weird ArenaNet television logo, and then with all the information that came out of TwitchCon, we kind of forgot to actually address what that was. <laughs> but um, it's not actually as exciting as we thought it would be. Basically, ArenaNet television is just, I guess, kind of their initiative for streaming more. Um, they got rid of the points of interest and ready up 
um, kind of live stream shows that they were doing once a week, and instead they have this new thing called Guild Chat, which kind of encompasses what um, Points of Interest and Ready, Ready Up and stuff were, but into more of a all-inclusive show, and they stream this show multiple times a week. Um, I think we got five episodes this week, so that's a lot. So they're... I don't know if that's gonna, like, kind of maintain after Heart of Thorns releases, or if they're just mm-hmm. like, okay, two weeks till Heart of Thorns, time to just pump out all the information. Or, yeah. These, um, other Guild Wars 2 streamers they mention, is this just oh, them playing the game, doing whatever? Um, basically, yeah. Like, before and after the Guild Chat episodes, they, I, they host, uh, various Guild Wars 2 streamers. And, yeah, I think for the most part it is just them kind of playing Guild Wars 2, like, you know, whatever kind of game mode that they prefer, whether they're yeah, leveling up characters. What other um, MMO companies have been doing recently, mm-hmm. um, trying to get more emphasis onto Twitch. I don't think League of Legends really does, but then again, it's a big streaming scene right. on there anyway. I believe they're, like, the most streamed game, generally. Right. Um, but yeah, other ones I've seen, like MMOs in particular, mm-hmm. doing this now. So I'm not surprised they kind of did this. Yeah, and it's really nice. I've noticed because they they tweet out like, oh, next up is so-and-so or next up is so-and-so on their official Twitter. And it's nice because I've noticed not only are they doing the typical kind of big Guild Wars 2 streamers like Bog Otter and Aurora Peachy and MMO Inks and all of them, but I've also noticed quite a few names that I hadn't ever seen before um, pop up that they've been hosting. So I don't know if that's part of that partner program they're working on or not. But if so, then that's pretty cool that they're kind of starting to... the the smaller... Um, Stumas, it's actually pretty good. Yeah. Glad they did that. So yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So I think I think it's three days this week that they did Guild Chat, and so they had various Guild Wars two streamers both before and after the show. Quite a few of them too. So that that is what Arena Net Television is. So if you want to like learn more about Guild Wars two streamers, definitely subscribe to the Guild Wars two channel because now that they are kind of encouraging more people to stream, and they've got them on their channel so that's pretty cool but yeah they they did spend pretty much all week on guild chat talking about guilds um we're not really we have a guild uh us at radio Freeteria. it's called carpathian mist because draculetta likes vampires and um uh but we it's a uh, we probably don't do as much with it as we probably should um but you know whatever but so we, we're not super knowledgeable about the current guild leveling and upgrading system and whatnot, but I do want to kind of touch on a few points. Basically, they talked about the Guild Initiative Headquarters, which is what, if you are watching the stream or video version of this podcast, that is what you are currently looking at. This is the Guild Initiative Headquarters in Lion's Arch. I almost said Los Angeles because, <laughs> because LA, but that's, no, it's not, it's, it's Lion's Arch. And, um... Basically, once Heart of Thorns launches, we'll be able to actually go in it and do things, and the things you'll be able to do in it, um, there's, like, various NPCs. You can start an expedition from inside of the uh, Initiative Headquarters. The expedition is basically, like, the quest to start and go and find your uh, guild hall, like, go claim your guild hall. Uh, it costs 100 gold to start this expedition, though, so be aware of that. Uh, I guess if you have, like, a bigger guild... That's probably not a big deal. Um, but yeah, it's 100 gold to do that. Um, another nice thing they mentioned, once you do go to kind of claim the guild hall, like they mentioned when they announced guild halls, you'll have to claim the guild hall. You'll have to kind of clear it out from Mordrum that have taken over, so you have to clear it out. Luckily, the number of Mordrum and how difficult it is scales based on how many people there are. So like if you have only five people in your guild there's going to be, like, an appropriate amount of Mordrum. It's not going to be the same amount of Mordrum that a 200-person guild is going to face. Because that'd be ridiculous. Um, so that's nice. So, you know, it's clear that they're trying to make these guild halls accessible to, you know, not just the big guilds, but the the smaller guilds, too. Although, interestingly, I did notice they said that there is a cap on, like, the number of people that can be in a guild hall instance at any one time. And the cap is 200, which is interesting because the... Um, maximum, like, uh, number of people you can have in a guild is 500. So I don't know how that'll work for the really big guilds that have, you know, the maximum number of people. But, you know, we'll see how that works. It it could change, maybe? I don't know. Um, but yeah, they've also going to be doing some updates to the guild panel that they talked about before that they're going to be introducing, uh, 
the ability to chat to any of the guilds that you are a part of, like whether you're representing them or not right now. You can only chat with the guild that you're representing, but now there's going to be different guild chat channels, so you can talk to everybody, which is nice. Um, also, they are going to be changing guild missions. Um, this is actually is actually really cool. Uh, basically, right now, guild missions, you have to upgrade your guild a whole lot in order to access doing guild missions, and you generally need a whole lot of people to do them. But they're making it so that even smaller guilds will be able to do guild missions. It's not going to be gated behind a whole bunch of upgrades. And uh, right now, guild missions are like a PvE thing that you have to go do. But guild missions are, they're going to have PvE guild missions, they're going to have PvP guild missions, and they're going to have World v. World guild missions. Which is, I think, a really good addition because, you know, right now there's tons of guilds that specialize in certain game modes. Like there's World v. World only guilds, there's PvP guilds, there's PvE guilds. So, you know, it it doesn't make sense for a PvP guild to do PvE guild missions. So now there's going to be PvP missions and World v. World missions and stuff. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, definitely a good addition. And uh, what else did they say? They really went, like, full deep dive on the information for this. Uh, they went all out. Um, they also talked about scribing, which is the new profession for um, the guild halls. Uh, it's pretty cool because you can, you know, every, guild, every uh, crafting profession makes backpacks. And a lot of them, personally, I'm not super fond of how they look. But the uh, scribe backpacks look pretty cool, especially if you have like a scholarly character because they look like um, like poster rolls with like letters and stuff sticking out of them, and they look pretty cool. Uh, they also went into really like a lot of detail about how to upgrade your guild halls. Um, I'm just gonna put link in the show notes because if we went over how how you do it, it'd take ages because you know they did a whole show on how to do it. Um, and they also talked a little bit about the guild hall arenas that you'll be able to kind of do. And so those are pretty cool. You can have up to, it seems like, 20 versus 20 sized battles. So yeah, that's, I think, I think, uh, it's definitely going to be good because it sounds like guild halls are making it so that, you know, big guilds have a lot to work, look forward to, but little guilds have a lot to look forward to as well. So I think that's about it as far as the guild stuff. Another thing that happened this week um, that I feel like we should talk about was the raid developer, Crystal Reed. T- um, somebody tweeted at her like asking, like, oh, you know, what kind of gear do you think we should have for raids? And she responded, you know, the first couple of uh, wings, you can probably get away with having... Hold on. I'm loading the tweet, and I'll just read it exactly. She says, Earlier wing bosses can probably be killed by top-tier players in a mix of Ascended and Exotic armor. Last boss should be full Ascended, so you should be wearing full Ascended armor to defeat the last boss. A lot of people got very, very upset about this. Um, both on Twitter, on Reddit, on Tumblr. Um, a lot of people uh, claim that this, this constitutes raid gating. But I don't think that's true at all. I think it's just saying, like, hey, this, like, you know, the the whole point of the raids was that this was going to be the challenging group content that people have been, uh, you know, like, clamoring for. And so I think it makes sense to have the top tier of gear to do it. I wouldn't expect people to not have ascended gear to do raids, if that's, like, the super challenging group content. Um, And also, like... When you think about it, Ascended Gear only has a 5% stat increase from Exotic Gear. So it's so in theory, like if you're super duper skilled, you could probably do it with Exotics if you really want to. It's going to be difficult, but, you know, the point is for it to be challenging. So I don't see why, uh, you know, saying that you should probably have Ascended Gear is elitist, as many have claimed. Yeah, like... um this seems like just kind of the standard raid thing of the harder the content gets, the better gear you're expected to have. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, this doesn't seem any... Like, people are saying this is the same mistake. I don't think it's a mistake to do this, because, of course, the harder the content is, the I mean, you're going to want better gear to make it easier for yourself. Right. Like you said, being better at or having a good composition of classes is probably going to be way more important than having full ascended. Right. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, like, knowing what you're doing in the raid isn't gonna, like, 
I mean, you can have full ascended, but if you don't know what you're doing or you're not organized and have a good leadership, you're going to wipe just as much as exactly uh, people in exotics. Exactly. So, yeah. I could see maybe an argument of if this content isn't, I, this content isn't um, built in a way that has a huge skill requirement of, yeah, you just do this and you can win. As long as you, like, have this good enough stats to, say, survive burst. Mm -hmm. Maybe then there's a, an argument for it, but I don't think, at least this tweet didn't seem that absolute about it. Should be full ascended is more like, yeah, it's a guide thing of preferably you'll have this. Right, it's not like not, you go you to... Must have this, otherwise you will get one shot. Right, it's not like you go to enter the raid and you get a pop-up that says, oh, you don't have ascended gear, you cannot do this content. It's not... Hello, Radiance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, there's... Tons of MMOs have had hard gear gating like that, where if you don't have... Or technically, higher levels of fractals in Guild Wars 2 have the same thing. Agony gating. Like, if you don't have enough agony resistance stuff on your gear at higher levels of fractals, you're just gonna die. Like, regardless of then whatever how you're is doing. That not elitist, if well, people are gonna make that argument. Yeah, exactly. So I don't... I don't see a problem with, like, you know, expecting yeah, people to be using incentive. is if the content is linear and shallow enough in terms of mechanics that like you need to have good enough gear to just survive mm -hmm. what the mobs do but I don't think it's going to be built like that otherwise you would have heard right. about it Yeah, even with the limited play that it's had yep pretty much so that's that's kind of the raid thing um, this week uh, this is actually going to be a longer episode than I expected with just the two of us I thought this was going to be pretty short but we're getting into a lot of discussions um, this week we also had a balance patch that was quite lengthy, actually. Um, we got a lot of balance stuff and, and tweaks to various classes. It would take ages to go through all of it. Um, some key things I noticed, though, uh, because I'm a necromancer, specifically, is that Corrosive Poison Cloud now destroys projectiles that enter its area. So that's handy. We get a projectile kind of block thing, which is good because we didn't really have any kind of uh, reflect or like a, any kind of projectile block thing. But yeah, uh, we'll put the link in the show notes because these are very lengthy. Um, yeah, I think the only one that I've made particular use of is the Guardian Shield of Absorption mm. because they changed it so you don't have to stand still, which in PvP is a huge deal. Like right. I actually used that when we were playing yesterday. Um, oh, just yeah. Blocking damage. Yep. And being able to move, it just has such a much bigger effect than I've actually kind of... Like, I prefer using that over the focus now. Oh, okay. Just because of how much protection it gives. Especially when I'm trying to, like, res somebody. Because mm -hmm. the knockback is useful, too. Right. Yeah, not moving in PvP is not great. Yeah, you can't not move. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a ranger in the perfect position. Yeah. Which is why rangers are hard to play. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. So, yeah, we'll put the link to that in the show notes. Um, also... They put a whole bunch of Halloween stuff up in the gem store and in um, the Black Lion weapon trading thing uh, because it's October, so, you know, Halloween and stuff. Um, there's Halloween weapons in the gem store. You can get a great sword that is made of a bat wing, if that's your thing. That rhymed unintentionally. No, you could have continued it, but you didn't. Because I can't think of puns like you can. I... I can't. It's just not in... I just can't. Sorry. Um, I guess you could have robbed one. <laughs> yeah. That was a stretch, but... That was a stretch. Uh, uh, points are trying, I guess. But another thing about Halloween that they did mention on the forums is that when Heart of Thorns goes live, the Halloween festival shenanigans are also going to be going live. So that's something to keep in mind. Um... If, you know, you don't want to have to f scrabble over everybody trying to do Heart of Thorns content, do the Halloween stuff instead. Although I don't imagine it's going to be very busy this year, regardless. No, it probably won't. Um, that's, yeah, it probably won't. But, you know, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, Halloween is a thing. The Hall I don't know if they're going to... They didn't say if they're going to add a whole lot of new stuff, but um, I guess we'll have to find out. I liked the Halloween stuff from last year. It was my first Halloween. I know a lot of people were kind of bored of it, because I guess it was like the, s the second or whatever time they'd done that stuff for Halloween. But I, I thought it was nice. I liked it. 
I wouldn't mind doing it again. Because that was kind of just after I joined, so I was still kind of like, ha ha, I don't know what is happening in this game, ha ha. So, it'd be nice to go back now that I actually know what I'm doing. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, yes, another thing that we wanted to talk about. This episode is so much longer than I expected it to be. Um, another thing we wanted to talk about was this quag and dance bug thing that got fixed. So, if you didn't know, which I didn't, um, this is, this was news to me, uh, basically you can, if, well, you could, if you use one of the quagan tonics, which, like, basically turns you into a quagan for a bit of time, you could do, like, you could kind of bug out your character so that you could do a dance. Basically, this was done by jumping in the air and landing while strafing, which would kind of bug out your character and make it look like, you know, get you stuck in the fall animation, which kind of looked like this weird little dance that the Quaggan was doing. People really liked this, apparently. I didn't know it existed at all. So, oh, oh well. Um, I missed out. But uh, what happened in this balance patch that the, we had this week was that they fixed this bug. And a lot of people are very upset about this. Um, MMO Central posted an article about it titled Guild Wars 2 Bans Quaggan Dancing, which I think is a bit hyperbolic, but... Um, yeah, a lot of people are very upset about this. Some people, um, actually think that they fixed this so that ArenaNet can then sell a Quaggan dance in the gem store, which I think is, to be honest, I think that's just ridiculous. I don't think that's happening. Um, feel free to, you know, rub it in my face if they do do that and say, ha ha, Sithrith, you're wrong, you're an idiot. But I super do not think that's gonna happen. Um, what I think happened was that they probably fixed some other falling-related bug um, for something else, and that happened to affect this falling, like this fall animation bug in the Quag and Tonic as well. I don't think they were like, "Hey, let's fix this Quag and animation so that they can't do it, and then we'll sell them stuff in the gem store." Yeah, I feel like that's a bit too cynical. Yeah. So, assuming that they actually did go out of their way to directly fix this, well, fix this bug, assuming, you know, well, I mean, it probably isn't intended, but assuming they did do that, I don't think this is really something worth spending time on. It, at least it didn't seem to really negatively impact anything. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know if your character can get, like, stuck doing that forever or something. Yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I didn't know it existed. It seemed harmless. Right. Like, it's a fun bug. Mm-hmm. Which you get in games, and I've seen them in other games, and people don't tend to mind having them in the game. Right. So yeah, assuming it was, I think that it was kind of a pointless thing to do. It doesn't really make the game better. It just kind of ticks off the community. Right. Well, like I said, something that people had fun doing, and now they can't do it anymore. Like I said, I'm what I'm. What I think happened is they probably fixed some other. Uh, they tried to fix some other instance of getting stuck in a fall animation and it happened to affect this also. Yeah, Yeah, maybe just the way they coded um, dancing or something like that Mm. or or strafing, something like that. that Right. Maybe just indirectly fix it. I'm hoping that's the case because that yeah, because I would much rather that than them wasting time fixing bugs that don't really hurt anything. Right. As far as them doing this to sell on the gem store, I don't really see that as like an argument you can really start. Firstly, because firstly, people have to buy a quaggan skin thing. Yeah, they have, to, they have to get a tonic. And then, how would you in- integrate a dance um, purchase considering it's not actually a dance, it's a strafe. Right. It just happens forever. Yeah, it's like a strafing fall animation that happens forever. So, yeah. It's, I... it's, it seems way too cumbersome. For it to even be worth it, especially if, like, it'd be a huge lack of foresight for them to actually do this now with so much complaining about it. Mm-hmm. They would lose them a lot more PR than they would gain in money that people probably wouldn't spend gems on in the first place. Right. Yeah, I, it seemed way too much of a long shot to even be worth considering in my book. Agreed. Um, I think that kind of covers everything, finally. Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we talked about the beta, we talked about the patch, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't really do a whole lot of stuff in-game besides the beta. I did do some Silver Waste stuff. I used, uh, my, I, I re-equipped my Ranger into all Berserker gear, 
Which, oh no, meta. Oh no. But, uh, you know. I just, I just like doing a lot of DPS on my rangers, so that, it made sense. Um, although I'm gonna make him a druid, so I don't know. Oh, another thing that happened was, it was my Mesmer's first birthday. So, yay! Happy birthday to my Mesmer. Because the other characters that I made before her, I deleted. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so my Mesmer is a year old, so that's pretty cool. That means I've been playing for over a year now. And yeah, that was exciting. Um, I did wanna, like, my, Thing that I learned this week, uh, since Drax not here, I figured I'd mention Felicia Day for him. He's gonna be so upset that I'm talking about this without him, but, uh, his beloved Felicia Day was on one of the more recent episodes of the Harmontown podcast as a guest. And she talked about her experience playing, you know, World of Warcraft and MMOs like that and meeting people online. So it's, it's relevant to this show, I think. Um, little warning. You know, uh, Harmontown, you kind of got to it's, it's not a usual kind of podcast. Uh, it's hosted by Dan Harmon, who is the creator of Community and Rick and Morty. Um, and it's a very kind of unusual podcast. They film it live on a stage, and you kind of have to be into Dan Harmon's kind of shtick and personality to kind of get into it. But, you know, he does a really good job of interviewing Felicia Day at length, and then they play a tabletop RPG called Shadowrun at the end. So that's kind of cool. So yeah, um, Felicia Day. Felicia Day is pretty cool. I'll give that to Dre. So, um, yeah, did you do anything else this week besides beta stuff? Uh, I mean, yeah, it was like that little bit based. I think I did some part of my personal story on my Guardian. I didn't really get too far. I think part of the level 60. Mm -hmm. I haven't actually done the reclaiming of that place. Um, yeah, but, yeah, it's just like, I've, I've just kind of been demotivated to actually play it until the expansion comes out, because I'm just kind of waiting for that. Right. I probably am just going to run with my Mesma first, partly because it's my first character, so I'll obviously have some sort of attachment to that, but also because right. it's a Silvari, and Silvari. get that Mordramath um, connection going. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Plus, Mesma's a lot more fun since the update, whereas Necro's kind of been... A bit less, so at least in terms of going full damage, where you can right. damage it and still tank things. Well, that's true, I suppose. They feel squishy in the UA, at least against players. But Mesma is just nuke stuff now, really mm. hard. And it's quite enjoyable. Yeah. Mesmers are tough. Well, I think that's about it. We did get a five star review on iTunes, so thank you, Bry Crew. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I apologize if I'm not. But thanks for reviewing us on iTunes. We really appreciate that. Uh, when you when you review us on iTunes, it's good for us because it kind of uh, helps us show up more on iTunes, like you know, higher up in like game related podcast lists on iTunes. So thanks for that. That does that does mean a lot to us. It really helps the podcast get seen by more people. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. And I think, unless you have anything else to say, Thoros, I think that's about it for the show.